Thanks, Dan, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so we're on the first of two days of conferences uh, on energy and sustainability. That's energy, climate, and all the things that are associated with it, water, food, poverty, are going to be the defining issues of the coming century. The problem of supplying the world's energy needs without producing irreversible climate change has been described as the hardest political problem the world has ever, see ever seen. It's a prisoner's dilemma, a free rider problem, and the tragedy of the commons all rolled into one. Um, but to quote a former US president, who was actually talking about something else, the difficulty of achieving a solution does not remove the obligation to try. And we, as the world's leading public university, have a special obligation in that regard, and one that I think we, the entire university and all its strengths needs, needs to um, have a, as its top agenda item. Dan mentioned tomorrow um, there will be a dedication for the I-4 Energy Center on the fourth floor of this building. And that's going to, the meeting then is going to focus on information technology for the smart grid and for energy efficient buildings, generally speaking the demand side. Uh, there's a formidable array of speakers including Nancy Skinner, Assemblywoman for Berkeley and Chair of the Assembly Natural Resources Committee and Art Rosenfeld until recently the California Energy Commissioner and a well-known scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Labs and our campus. He was a particle physicist who switched to the study of energy and has had an enormous impact on energy use in California and nationally. Today, as you heard from Dan, the focus will be on the larger challenge of both the supply and demand side balance in relation to the sustainability of the planet. Um, it's been organized by Dan, by Paul Wright, and the Energy Resources Group looking around the room. I think there are a number of people here old enough to know that ERG is actually an energy unit. Um, and uh, we have speakers from public policy, law, and economics. Um, we know that many of the disturbing changes in our environment can be linked to our present carbon dioxide level of 387 I looked it up yesterday, parts per million as compared to 280 ppm prior to the Industrial Re Revolution. As Dan mentioned, I'm a physical scientist, and scientists are, were certainly capable of determining what levels of carbon dioxide are desirable and sustainable, but doing that's not going to be enough. We have to engage with those in public policy, law, economics, and industry to make any metrics actually create change. In a similar vein, we can't allow any of our new inventions and breakthroughs in renewable energy, in wind power, solar power, or electrical storage, for example, to become stranded assets. Such technologies will need to be incorporated into the grid, and political support for building a new grid infrastructure is critical. Just a few days ago, I received a letter from Governor Schwarzenegger calling on our scientific and academic communities in California to take full advantage of DOE's recent announcement to invest $366 million to establish energy innovation hubs, one for each of the following three areas, sunlight to fuel, energy efficient buildings, and modeling and simulation for nuclear energy. There's going to be very stiff national competition for each of these hubs, and now more than ever, UC Berkeley and LBNL We'll need to pool our respective strengths with appropriate partners to put forward the strongest proposals possible. Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley Labs have a rich history of linking energy technology to public policy, and I hope today we will take a crucial first step in defining what we should do, not what we think we can do. As the President said last night, uh, the country that wins the green economy race wins the global economy race. And your deliberations today, I think, are crucially important in achieving that goal. Um, Paul asked me if I would be willing to answer questions. Uh, and although I do have a car,
to take me to Chicago to discuss a small matter of $750 million. Um, I'll be willing to uh, answer a couple of questions if there are any. Yes. I have a question. In Copenhagen, there was, it, it opened with a, a sort of plea for a global vision. They had a video of a girl and a hurricane and all this stuff. And there's this idea that people need to work together. And at the same time, you know, Obama talking, as you mentioned, about competing with other nations to win the, the green race. How do you juxtapose those two sort of conflicting principles of uh, international unity and international competition? I think many of the, the green solutions will be local in nature and therefore will benefit and, and, and therefore unlike many of our technological solutions which benefit the rich developed countries may have a, have a correspondingly larger impact in the less developed parts of the world. So I think that, that uh, it will, uh, of necessity there is no silver bullet to this problem. There are bullets with larger caliber to be sure but there's no one solution and, and uh, many of the solutions I think will be more ecumenical than what we have been thinking about in the past. <laughs>